gave permission for stopover, Cuban troops can fly to Guyana and then go straight across. Mm -hmm. Guyana can't help for that. You know, because it was something not in the interests of the United Even States. Even though they were on the line. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. You know, you're not supposed to. Matter of fact, the fact that Cuba was in the in the non aligned movement was seen to be an anachronism in, in the first in the first instance. You mentioned Paul Fordham and so on, but give us Paul Fordham, Erigiri, and Erivado. I think regionalists, forward thinkers on all of their parts. Burnham is the one who was more left inclined. Mm -hmm after a while. Again, Burnham was initially not a socialist or a communist, but there was a more conservative ideological dimension to Barrow and Eric Williams. Burnham was further to the, to the left. But you've got to give credit to those gentlemen and others for being visionary and regionalists and internationalists in a certain sense where they would do some things that were right for the right reason even if they may not have been right at the right at time, the right time. And, and, and I'll give you one example of that Jamaica, Guyana, Trinidad and Barbados together established diplomatic relations with China at the same time. They said it's the right thing to do, but it's also, they take some risk by doing it individually, do it together. That didn't mean that Eric Williams was a communist. That didn't mean that Errol Barrow was a communist, but they were foreign policy, engagements, pursuits that they felt were correct for the region, correct for their nation, mm -hmm. uh, that, they, that they pursued. Mm -hmm. What are some immediate threats that challenge the economic and security development of Guyana and the Caribbean region? I'm going to interpret that question as having the genesis having the germ of another question. Okay. And I think the preliminary question mm -hmm. is, what do we mean by security? And that question, it's important to ask and answer that question because you added correctly so, economic. Yes. Uh, I wrote a book in 1993, I think, the quest for security in the Caribbean. And I outlined there my definition of security, which I've been embracing and practicing and using ever since I wrote that book. And there I argue that, and it's not unique to me, it's not unique to the Caribbean, but at the time when I was writing it, it was kind of out of the norm. Mm -hmm. Caribbean security is not only about military stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's about economic stuff also. Mm -hmm. It's about environmental stuff. Mm -hmm. I remember being in Argentina at an organization of American states meeting and after I gave my speech, the Colombian ambassador came to me and said, Professor Griffith, I never realized that Bananas could be a security issue until I met the Prime Minister then, Dame Eugenia Charles of Dominica. Mm. She was talking about banana, not in the sense of the fruit, but she was talking about banana as the economic security fulcrum around which Dominica revolves. So if you take away the economic security of bananas in that time, you had the Central American and South American countries rivaling Caribbean countries producing a cheaper banana. Mm -hmm. As I said in Argentina, I've written over the years, in the Caribbean context, in small state context, 
you've got to go beyond the military in asking the question, what is security? And you've got to go beyond the military in understanding what are the challenges and threats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in the context of that broader than military definition, I would say that there are four core challenges facing Caribbean countries. And I'll speak about them in April. I'm going to the OAS. Uh, they have a session on small state security diversity. Okay. If you take that notion that security is both domestic mm -hmm. and international, mm -hmm. it is beyond military, mm -hmm. it includes economic, it includes environment, okay. I would say that among the four clear and present dangers facing Caribbean countries is the internal security, the crime and violence. Hmm. No. Now, it's no consolation if you are in Guyana to say that Jamaica has more homicides a year. It's no consolation if you're in St. Kitts to say that Dominican Republic has a higher quotient of violence. There is a troubling for the last decade or so persistence and in some cases periodic spiraling of crime. And one of the dangerous dynamics involved is that a significant proportion of the crime, the violence, the homicides, is prosecuted with weapons. No longer people slap each other right. or get a cutlass and cut you up. The access to weapons is so readily there that weapons are prosecuted. So I would say cross the landscape of the region. Mm -hmm. And, and Selwyn, so uh, over the decades I've written and spoken about Caribbean, I'm not limiting my, I don't limit myself to the Anglophone Caribbean. There are more people in the island of Hispaniola, shared by Dominican Republic and Haiti, mm -hmm. than all the English-speaking Caribbean combined. And so for me, and it's one of the things that Eric Williams talked about way back when he was writing, you've got to focus on the broader Caribbean, mm -hmm. what is sometimes called the Grand Caribe. So if you look at what's happening in Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Guyana, Trinidad, St. Kitts, I would say the internal crime situation, the violence that is driven there is one of the common denominators facing the entire region. Some of that domestic violence, some of that homicide rate has a nexus to the drugs phenomenon. The connection, the connection is there. And, and again, I remind people, and I wrote a book about it in 1987, Drugs and Security in the Caribbean Sovereignty on the Siege. The drugs phenomenon is not a one-dimensional phenomenon. It's not only drugs passing through. There was a time when people conveniently like to think that it's only drugs passing through. A lot of cultivation of stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of consumption. Mm -hmm. A lot of money laundering. Mm -hmm. And so, whether in the prosecution of the transshipment, the trafficking, or the protecting of turf for production, mm -hmm or in the sale, there is criminality, mm -hmm. is that violence. So the connectivity on the narcotics front is not only a multi-dimensional connectivity, mm -hmm. but that drugs phenomenon helped to fuel some of the violence, some of the crime, some of the homicides. You know, our dear Guyana has a dubious distinction along with Haiti and Dominican Republic and Mexico in being on the world's top 20 most murderous nations list. Most murders? The number per capita of murders happening. This is 2014 data. Uh, but it's no consolation to say that right next to in Venezuela, you've got the equivalent of Iraq every couple of hours. Mm -hmm. Crime, domestic violence, is a clear and present danger across the Caribbean, Anglophone, Hispanic, Francophone. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I have to apologize to you tonight. I'm, I'm so engrossed in this conversation, so enthralled so after the cricket, that I could have to take breaks. And you know what, you already mentioned you're coming back here because there's so many things that I have questions I want to ask you. 
Well, let me go to the chat room. There are some questions in here. Then I say, what's his current analysis of the security situation in Guyana? Well, the security situation in Guyana is partly connected to the scenario for the region that I refer to. Mm -hmm. uh, that dubious distinction of being in that top 20 list yes. of most murderous. But what I think is true of Guyana is true of other countries, some in the Caribbean, but some also in Africa and parts of Asia. You've got to look beyond the criminality by the practitioners of the crime to the institutions in the society that can help to ameliorate that crime. Mm. I'll give a couple of examples example what I mean. If Jeffrey wants to commit a robbery, and Jeffrey knows that the police don't have vehicles to come and look for him when he commits this robbery, Jeffrey is likely to be a little more bold yes. in committing that robbery. If Jeffrey also knows that even if he is caught, the police and the criminal justice architecture are not likely to A, uh, bring him to trial anytime soon, mm -hmm. B, on the jurisprudence of the society, he has the right to appeal, and it can be for a long time before he comes out at the end of the whole judicial process. But the victims of Jeffrey's criminality also are frustrated. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, why should I call the police to report any crime? I will just take law into my own hand. What we've been finding in many parts of the Caribbean, including in Ghana, people have been taking law into their own hand because the police force has been neglected over the years. Neglected not only in terms of establishment strength, number of personnel, number of policemen, you go to almost every Caribbean country, you find policemen from Guyana there. You don't pay them well, they leave. There's a massive ex-police association of, in New York. Policemen who have emigrated. So the police force is under strength. Mm -hmm. Equipment is not there adequate. Training is not there over the years adequate. And so inefficiency has been the hallmark of dealing with criminality. But let's keep in mind, Selvin, that it is not only the front end, the police force or the army that matters. It's the courts. What happens there? Are there sufficient judges and magistrates? Mm -hmm. The backlog of cases, trials, so significant. And then, so let's say you go to the tail end, the prison. Prisons all overcrowded. So what's your reaction? So, the reality is that sometimes magistrates, knowing the conditions, and I'll come back to prisons in a, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in, a, in a minute, they fine you, pay this fine. You'll pay the fine and go back to practice their criminality. I say all of that to say that whether it's Guyana or Jamaica or Trinidad, dealing with criminality is not a one-dimensional phenomenon of, let's say, fixing the police only. You've got to look to see what can be done for alternative sentencing. You've got to ask, what do I need to bring the police, the, the, the judges and the courts up to strength? What do I need to do to make the prisons places, you know, not only have there been prison breaks in Guyana, but the prison officers complain because the conditions under which they have to live and work, insalubrious, unhealthy, inhuman. And so Guyana's project, and I'm delighted to see that Vice President, Minister of National Security, and the Attorney General and Allied folks are paying attention to the broad tapestry. It's not only fixing the police force, mm -hmm. it's also looking at the throughput and the tail end, the prisons, the courts, the parole system. You know, what can we do with alternative? You, 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 you take the reality of most Caribbean countries. You ask, what's the demographic in the prison? I would bet you 50 bucks of your money that you'll find the most significant proportion of the prisoners are between the ages of 16 and 35. What? It's true of America too. But it's no consolation to say that that's true of America only. 
And think of what a cohort of 16 to 35 means in terms of a society's ability to use the productive capacity of those citizens. Yeah. And then you ask the question, is there rehabilitation when they're in prison? So that when they come out, they can be productive citizens. Um, we, to, to, to we make, mm -hmm. I make, make one final point to the prisons. Uh, you might know this guy by some of his writings, Fyodor Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. Dostoevsky said once that if you really want to know what a society thinks of its civilization, look inside its prisons. Look to see how it treats its citizens and others. Yes. And that gives you a clue as to what it, 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 it thinks of itself. When I was researching that book, Drugs and Security, I spent or attempted to spend a day at the Port of Spain prison. Just to look. I couldn't spend the whole day. The conditions. Wow. And I gave a lecture in... Uh, Trinidad a couple of two years ago, police, and I quoted one of the ministers in 2011 talking about the conditions of prisons. So if you ask, who are these people who are incarcerated? What is their relationship to the broader society? You've got to assume that most of them are, unless they're on death row, you're going to let them out at some point. What do they do? Exactly. Who do they become? Who, they, who do they become? Are they practitioners of recidivism, just going back in? Do they have any skills to enable them to be productive in the society? And which is why I'm delighted that President Granger began to let some of the young prisoners who were just misdemeanors out. Uh, not only is the overcrowding a compelling reason to do something, but what do you do with a 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 year old person who is just there and then you let you let them out, you let her out. A lot of them are women too. Years after the rape, what do they do? What programs are there to absorb them in society? And so I would say, in looking at the criminality issue, you've got to go beyond the police to ask what's, hap ask what's happening in the courts, what's happening in the prisons, what can be done domestically, what can be done collaboratively internationally to help to make some changes. A few more questions in the chat room. We have to wrap it up. I, I can't believe all this time is Um Neil asked, extension on Dennis. Security from a national rather than public security perspective. Are there signs, and Dennis asks, are there signs that the security situation in Guyana improving since the change of government in Guyana? Let me, let me take the, the aspect of Neil's question first. I think what Neil was getting to, I didn't come back to it adequately. He was getting, I think, to the national security, the traditional and Guyana's traditional security threats have to do with the territorial claims. Five-eighths of the country on the western front, 6,000 square kilometers in the eastern front, none of which is adequately, will not resolve. Yeah. In the mind of Venezuela, even though the arbitral award of 89 to 9 settled it, in the mind of Venezuela, it is still a claim. Uh, I mentioned in a lecture I gave in Georgetown last July, that the first time I went to Venezuela, I couldn't understand why they were playing the national anthem so frequently. It was then, and it still is, a jingoistic sentiment of keeping la zona en reclamación in the minds of Venezuela. This is a zone to be taken back. And part of that security challenge is replicated with much smaller implications on the Eastern Front with Suriname. You might have noticed that President Bauchas has said a couple of months ago he plans to reopen the new River Triangle claim. So I think, yes, a significant part of what Guyana's security landscape is all about is not only the crime domestically, it's also those claims. I think it's important for 
us to embrace what the government stand is, that they are controversies, but the reality is, unless they are settled in the minds of the people who are claiming them, they're going to be claims that they pursue. It was also good to hear that the government plan, government of Ghana plans to invest in getting some assets, military assets. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is not comforting to know that we don't have a fleet of military aircraft. It is not comforting to know that we don't have an adequate maritime component. Mm -hmm. So I think the government has begun to make the investments. It's going to take time because it's not only getting the high powered helicopters or whatever uh, air assets, it's investment in training, investment in maintenance, investment in the ancillary skills that are needed to support what the pilots do, the ancillary skills that they need to support what the, 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 the men aboard the, the maritime assets do. And so I think what Neil is quite rightly asking me to do is not to forget mm -hmm. the, the national territorial mm -hmm. security components. Uh, and we've got, and that brings me to the environment, we've got another threat coming from the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, global warming is accentuated yeah. the extent to which the Atlantic Ocean is increasingly making inroads, it's a threat. It's an environmental threat. Mm -hmm. I'm delighted to see that uh, Rear Admiral Gary Brest has that portfolio of, of trying to help the government do, help, help the nation do something in, in that front. And the last one, Dennis asks, are there signs of the security situation there is improving since the change of the I think there are at least three signs. And if you just take a look at the budget from Minister Winston Jordan last Friday, you can see the, the significant planned investment, not only in the police, but in equipment. But here is another component, and I was pleased to see it happen not too long after the elections. Guyana's security situation, especially when you take the drugs element of it, mm -hmm. especially when you take the terrorism vulnerability element to it, are transnational, which means other countries are affected and other countries have got to be part of the investment in doing something. And if you take a look at what's been the public evidence on the willingness of the United States, mm -hmm. public evidence on the willingness on the part of the United Kingdom to come to the table. And for President Granger very often refers to his asking the British come back with the security sector reform project that my predecessors rejected. Mm -hmm. Let's put them on the table. So I think that is the second, the fact that international stakeholders are coming to the table, recognizing A, that they've got some interests that are on the threat, and B, Ghana needs help. But here's a third. Just having the conversations locally, just having the conversations in the diaspora. You, you can try to sweep something under the rug and pretend you don't have a problem. It's like this suicide thing. Uh, our previous leaders pretended that they was no, didn't want to talk about it. It doesn't go away just because you pretend it's not there. So I think the fact that the president, the prime minister, the other ministers are willing to be challenged on what are we doing, are you doing enough or not, mm -hmm. and talk about the issue and elicit the support elicit the engagement, elicit the ideas of others. I think that is a telling difference, and I'm comforted that we're moving in the right direction. I have three quick questions for you. Uh, what are you most proud of? If you were to come to my home, uh, and one, one day you'll come, you're going to see a sign, a nice big picture, with three words, each of which starts with the letter F. Mm -hmm. Faith. Yes. Family. Yes. Friends. I am very proud of my family. Yes. I have a wonderful wife. We've been together a little more than three decades. We have two wonderful kids, one of whom married last year. Got a wonderful husband. Uh, she's an investigator with the city of New York. He teaches English as a second language. They set the basis for a wonderful new family. I've got a son in California, a musician, and he's in the banking area. 
proud of my wife, proud of my kids, proud of family. Also delighted to have a number of great friends across the world. Now, when the kids were with us before they grew up, I would take them and we would take them on trips. I did a lot of traveling, <laughs> a lot of traveling. And sometimes they'll be, they'll be pleasantly surprised that almost every place that I go to, I've got friends, and not friends in low places only. And some of my friends go back to UG days, some of my friends go back to YSM days, some of my friends go back to my journalism days, some of my friends go back to the academy, I've got a network. And so, especially as you get, you go old, older, you appreciate the importance of friendship. And so, as I said to many people, I don't wear my religion on my sleeves, but faith is important to me. Faith, family, friends. If you could go back in time, what would you tell a 60-year-old I would tell him, remember what Miss Dunbar used to tell you. Miss Dunbar was a teacher in high school who taught us mathematics and Latin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're ahead of the class, you finish your work fast and you just play around. Yes. Ms. Dunbar used to say to us, myself and a, a friend who is a veterinarian now in the Bahamas, ex nihilo nihil fit. Ex nihilo nihil fit. Out of nothing comes nothing. She used to say, stop skylarking. You finish your work. Read another book. Uh, I should have read more books. <laughs> Okay, you finish so fast. I finished so fast. I'm just, <laughs> Godfrey and I would just hang around, <laughs> throw darts to the girls, and do, do stuff. <laughs> Pay attention it? to broadening. Okay. What makes you laugh out You know, I was a dean at Florida International University, the president at the time, Modesto Maidike. He had one entire session of the President's Council. And the President's Council was all the deans, all the vice presidents, the University General Council. And we had one session about managing stress. Mm -hmm. All of us, each of us was asked, you know, what do you do to manage stress? One of the things that makes me laugh out the loudest helps me to manage stress, and that is human. <laughs> uh, and so, I like good humor. Now, sometimes the definition of good humor is so individualized and uh, personalized that you've got to be careful what may be funny to you. Yes. And sometimes my wife has saved me from myself. I would say to, you know, at my church, St. George's, we used to have an annual in the fall, kind of, somebody can sing, somebody can dance. I often read poetry. Mm. But then one year I said, I'm going to tell some jokes. And I'm so thankful that I run to the jokes <laughs> by my wife. She said, honey, do not. That's not funny. You're going to make people mad at you. And I'm so glad I did because when I showed it to um, Pastor Rollins, uh, he said, Doc, <laughs> he said, Doc, I don't know where those jokes will come over well. But you, you've got to, as a way of managing managing the societies and your own families, mm -hmm. challenges and opportunities and the personal challenges. But I find humor is a is a good way to make you laugh out loud and a good way to manage stress. Thank you, Dr. Griffiths. And to the listeners, thank you for tuning in. I close with, fear not what fear whispers to you. Fear your obedience to it. Good night.